Welcome again to the Richmond Knob Hill Crime Prevention Open House. Not only is it the first one in history that is actually held online for Richmond Knob Hill, this is actually kind of a new thing, but it is also uh, the first ever pants optional open house that uh, has ever been run. So as people are talking, the question is, is whether or not people are actually wearing pants, which is uh, can be a bit of an interesting question. So we, to introduce our guest speakers tonight, we have Richard Wall. He's a senior constable with the Calgary Police Service. He has 24 years of policing experience, uh, 15 years of that with the Calgary Police. And he has uh, been uh, six years as the community resource officer for the Calgary Police Service. My name is Mark McGilvery. I'm a committee member with the Martaloop Crime Prevention Committee uh, with the Martaloop Community Association. So I've been two years on that committee and uh, also have been a, a lead for nextdoor.com for South Calgary. Our agenda for the evening will be a review of the crime prevention perception statistics and, and then we'll be comparing them to the actual statistics. We'll review some of the uh, things we can use on social media and then we'll be turning it over to Senior Constable Rich Wall, where he will give a presentation and then we'll be following up with a question and answer. Nicely, of course, there's also door prizes. Uh, whenever I do these sor sorts of events, I do like to promote local business, especially during the time of COVID. And we do have door prizes of two $25 gift certificates and one $40 gift certificates for Volo's Pizza, which, uh, arguably is the best pizza in Calgary. And how this will work is that if you're the winner of it, I'll be delivering your names to the pizza place. And then when you do place your order, you say, my name is so-and-so, I won the $25 or $40 gift certificate, and they will, uh, they will deduct that from your order. Also, uh, Amanda Helmer of Service Credit Union, has donated a $50 gift certificate for 10 degrees chocolate. So if you're the lucky winner of both gift certificates, of course, then you both have dinner and dessert. So actually that's really quite handy. So when I do talk to people, when they, when they do come into and move into the community, some of them, when they hear Richmond Knob Hill, aren't really sure of exactly where it is, where the borders are. So the area that we're talking about is bordered on the north by 17th Avenue, to the west by 26th Street and Sarcy Trail, to the south by 33rd Avenue, and to the east by 20th Street and 17th Street Southwest. And smack dab in the middle is the Richmond Knob Hill Community Association. Their uh, contact details in terms of telephone number and email are there. They are in the process of creating a crime prevention committee as well. So if they're, and I believe that community associations are the single best way for a community to pull together to deal with problems such as uh, community safety. So next thing we're gonna cover is the crime and safety perception results. I sent the poll out to everyone that attended the meeting. And in addition, we, uh, we also sent it out to the uh, people in Nordstor, in Nextdoor from Richmond Knob Hill. And what we found is that without question, the two biggest areas of concern are residential or non-residential break and enters, as well as thefts from vehicle with over 50% in both cases, believing that they're major problems. And Dale Parrott has entered the meeting. In addition to this, the, uh, are, there's also, with a, with a, when it comes to things that are violent crimes, such as robberies and assaults, no one that was surveyed believed that they are a major problem and that thefts of vehicles themselves are also considered to be a relatively minor problem as well. So in that case, uh, what was also collected were, were comments. And so, a lot of them deal with uh, things that were mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, but people's bikes getting stolen from their garage, break and, attempters att break and enter attempts at their vehicles, 
car prowling, vehicle break-ins, uh, criminal boldness, um, vehicles being rifled through, and even vehicles attempted to be stolen. So a lot of these are very, very good comments and they're very, very good feedback. The reason I like to do these uh, crime perception surveys is that we can actually compare what people's perception are of, of, uh, of crime with the actual crime that actually happens. So if we take a look at the Richmond Knob Hill uh, crime statistics here, uh, before I go into it, I just want to indicate that the top, the, the far left column is the most recent at October 2020 and actually goes backwards in time to November of 2019. And with the total amount of crimes located at the end of the column. And what we see here, of course, is that if you take a look at the theft from vehicles, the break and enter for other premises and break and enter dwellings, that comprises over 50% of all reported crime in the Richmond Knob Hill area. So our perception of the crime in the community is actually matches pretty well, almost exactly to what we actually see, which is really, really good to see. In addition, if we want to see how Richmond Knob Hill stacks up compared to other communities, what we see is that Richmond Hill, Richmond Knob Hill is very much in the middle of the road. So they aren't experiencing as much crime as Clarence and Glengarry with 271, but there are more than Rutland Park, Scarborough and Curry who are actually having reported crimes of less than 100. So that's the statistic portion of the program. The, the next program is, part of the program is to talk about social media. One of the nice things about social media is it does enable us to foster relationships both within communities, between communities, and between the community and the Calgary Police and other forms of government. The main ways we can do this, and we'll touch on, on these three as the major ones, are the 311 app, or calling 311. There's nextdoor.com and there's the bikeindex.com. So what we'll start off with is to talk about the 311. Uh, the nice thing with the 311 is that they've moved to an app form for their, uh, for their uh, outreach to the community, which is actually quite cool because what you're able to do is whenever you put in a new request, you can attach a video and you can attach photos to it. And also what it enables you to do is to be able to check and keep track of your own requests that you've put into the system, as well as other ones that, that get put in as well. This is really, really good because it enables, enables people to almost identify or be made aware of problems in their community through this way. So, and how this would kind of work, just to give you a, a shot of what the back end looks like, is that you say oh, that I choose to report a situation, it'll give you some categories. And again, given that we're now into the snowy weather, it's snow on road or people not shoveling their walks, but also garbage maintenance and untidy uh, private property and, and also others as well. And as you can see on the right, what you're able to do when you do put in your request is you're able to put in both um, the write-up for it as well as uh, photographs as well. And this would this is something that I think does elevate it above the 311 phone call is, is this sort of thing. Then again, what you're able to do is you're able to monitor your own requests as well as other requests that have been recently made in the area. And if there's an area of concern that you are particularly concerned about, you can star it and what that will enable you to do is to follow that over time to make sure those things are addressed. And in addition to actually having the listing, they have also have a handy dandy map, which en enables you to see what specific areas of the community have requests being put in for them. The next uh, social media app that I'd like to talk about is Nextdoor. If anyone is familiar with Nextdoor, it's kind of like Facebook, but it's focused directly on your community. And 
how that kind of works is that it it's kind of works as like a private social network. People that get put into that join next door, their address is verified and they are put into the community that they are that they that they're a part of. While they're what they're able to do when they do send out messages is that they get it basically is limited to the people in the community. And so what this means is that it's safe because uh, real names and real addresses are there. It's local, so it's there's a specific boundary of which contains the community, and it's also valuable. So knowing that, for example, if you're looking for recommendations for stuff around your area, it's being given by the people in the area for the people in your area. And again, this does come in very, very handy for things such as crime and safety. So in addition to crime and safety issue, which is kind of on the right hand side where we talk about neighborhood watch and receiving urgent alerts, but also there's an opportunity to meet your neighbors, borrow ladders, uh, the communities, the next door community areas also had maps for people who wanted to be able to offer during the time of the lockdown, if, if you were in quarantine, someone would actually go out and purchase groceries and deliver them for you on your behalf. And this helping helping your neighbors out kind of thing was very, very popular with the Nextdoor app. Um, and again, very much like 311, what you're able to do is share both photos and video. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to uh, pull up the actual Nextdoor app, um, right? right here and just to give you an idea what it looks like so for example uh, so how it kind of looks is that very much like facebook paste postings of your of your neighbors goes goes up and you get to see what's happening if there's an area that you're particularly concerned with let's say you want to sell something you want to take a look at public services in our case if we're talking about crime and safety these are things that we can look at for sure. So um, in this case, somebody saw a coyote on 19th Street and 34th Avenue, pretty exciting. Uh, some people talking about whether or not they should, they should report their neighbor, neighbor for COVID-19 restriction violations, very interesting. Um, but again, what you're able to do is to actually click on these and, and, and get that further information. So again, this was a bit of a practical joke, but someone dressing up as the, uh, finish Santa Claus and and scaring little kids during Christmas as was going on and was the the police have been were, were told about it and this person's idea of a practical joke was was basically held off on so that's kind of what that's about there so um, what I'll do I'll just go back to share the screen and uh, and again what we're doing here is that uh, if we can use this app to keep everyone informed about suspicious activity, then this is what we can do. For example, uh, one gentleman I was talking to, he uh, was uh, out for his morning walk after a fresh snowfall like we had this morning and noticed that there were footprints going from vehicle to vehicle to vehicle. And so what he was able to do is that he headed on ahead and found the person that was uh, rifling door handles to try to get get the stuff out of people's unlocked vehicles. And so what he was able to do is to put a call into 911 and get the police to actually pick him up. So he was also able, and then the police were able to go back and go into the Nextdoor app, requ requisition information from people who had the Nest cameras to uh, to see if uh, things were, if uh, there was anyone that could uh, have that information. So. Um, so basically what we're, when we do talk about next door, what we're doing is we're empowering ourselves and, and neighbors who might not, who might not otherwise build community and partner with government to create safer, stronger, and more resilient neighborhoods. And again, one of the things that we can do is to use this next door app and start using the 311 app at the same time. For example, if there's an area of the community, which is unusually dark, let's say there's burnt out street lights talking about it on Nextdoor and suggesting as a course of action that 311 uh, be, people should put in their 311 
uh, requests, then those build up into a file. And when there's enough on the file, the city takes it and can go and get it uh, repaired immediately. Um, the, and the third and final uh, social media app is the www.bikeindex.com. What you're able to do here is that if you have your bike, you can register the bike on the site and if it gets stolen and it gets recovered by police, then what they're able to do is to go into Bike Index, pull up your registration number and return your bike. And I pulled this screenshot up a couple of days ago and uh, it's over $13 million work worth of bikes have been uh, recovered. So that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. So what I'm gonna do here, I just got a phone call from Rich Wall. So um, what I'm gonna do here is uh, see if he's uh, on. So thank you very much for uh, your patience. Uh, may I take this opportunity to introduce Rich Wall of the Calgary Police Service. Okay, no worries. Um, so for Richmond Knob Hill, currently right now, we're doing pretty good on crime. I'm just getting the final stats right through here as I can just bring them up right now. Um, I have them right up now. So, let's have a quick look here. All right. So, currently for Richmond Knob Hill, we're doing pretty good for crime. We had a bit of a blip earlier in the year um, when we had um, some car prowlings that were going on. Throughout, um, the rest of 2020 we were good until we got to around about just have a quick look here make sure i've got the correct stats here um just to do of our b and e's around i'm gonna say just make sure i just got the right stats here it's gonna be in october so i started getting phone calls in october um regarding some of the detached garage uh, b and e's that we were having uh, we related them down to um, a drug house that we had just off Richmond Road and 23 Avenue. And we were successfully shutting that down, which is pretty good. So um, right now, regarding our crime, we're way down on our crime in Richmond Knob Hill and the bottom of South Calgary and up into Altador. So we're doing quite well. So at the beginning of the year, obviously COVID um, came in and we, uh, we were locked down. That cut our crime for about 58%. Um, throughout all of our districts, including Richmond, Knob Hill, but we still started to suffer from our opportunist crime. So we were suffering from car prowlings and we were getting our detached garage B&Es. We had some pretty incredible stats that came out of that, that out of our B&Es, um, I think we had two, just double checking here for our residential. I'll double check the, uh, just double check them here. Um, Richmond. Yes, so we had, um, in July, we had 11 break-in enters. Out of all of those, none of them were residential. All of them were detached garage. Um, and then we had eight the following month, and now we're down to four uh, for the entire month of October and all the way through November. 90% of all of our detached garage uh, b and were either unlocked doors, or we had as um, basically unlocked. That's the issue that we're having across the city, that we're in the high 90% for um, back doors and man doors being left unlocked and, um, and they're getting in. So they're not actually break-ins, they're actually walk-ins, which is um, a bit of a problem. With our car prelins, again, we're around about 87% unlocked and 95% were with property on view in the vehicles um, so throughout the year we've been pushing the 9 p.m routine which is um, uh, a really uh, a fantastic system that we put out we've had a lot of success with it it's just like a little checklist that everyone should go by for at 9 p.m every single um, every single night you know putting outside lights on make sure your vehicles are locked make sure that you've taken any property out your vehicles your garage doors are locked your man doors are locked and windows are closed and that you know we've had an awful lot of success with that 
Um, Richmond Knob Hill is interesting because you're sandwiched between Richmond and then um, <clears throat> the bottom of South Calgary and the top of Bankview. And so what we've been noticing, certainly over COVID, is that we've had a bleed over um, of crime from the downtown core. So what we are seeing is random theft. So um, we're seeing vehicles unlocked that are left with change in the center console or with uh, laptops and handbags, believe it or not, in vehicles. And um, we get into the call and there's no forced entry. And they're very modern vehicles. And to get into a modern vehicle, you need a key. You don't slim jimmy way into a modern vehicle now. They're all got deadlocks on them. They're all got shielded locks. So we, we know that vehicles have been left unlocked. Um, and we're also having an issue with proximity keys. Um, so we know that um, uh, people are walking away from their vehicles expecting a vehicle to lock. They go into their house, they move the keys in the house. The keys come within the, um, the distance of the proximity lock of the vehicle and the vehicle unlocks and it stays unlocked all night. So we've been using 9 p.m. to routine to just make sure that people um, are aware that we have these issues and that you know they're just simple common sense tips that we've had a huge amount of success with. So getting back to our b and that we had in the later part of the year, um, we had a lot of um, uh, de detached garage breaking in. As when I say a lot, um, Richmond Knob Hill generally has very low numbers, um, but we started to see a spike um, around about the end of October and into November. Um, we had six. And what we saw is that every single one of them was unlocked. We knew that we had offenders that were in the area that were targeting um, specifically unlocked garages. We weren't getting forced entry. If we did, it was very minor. They were literally slipping poor locks. And so um, we related that back to that drug house. So I did an operation, a nighttime operation in November, and um, that house uh, is now a hole in the ground. We worked with the uh, landlord on that address. And um, once we had uh, arrested a whole bunch of people from that house, we actually got the landlord to shut the, the house down because it was very poorly run. And it's now just a big hole in the ground, which is fantastic. I checked on it yesterday just to make sure it still is a hole on the ground because it was a real pain in my side. Um, and we got rid of that, which was really good. So since then, we've seen quite a radical drop in our crime in Richmond Knob Hill, which has been super good. Um, right now, for the whole of November, we have had to December, we, since the end of October into now, we've had six breaking enters, and every single one of them has uh, not been residential, which is good. Um, so, yeah, we've done the 9 pm routine. We've also been working with a lot of the condo, condominium building managers and owners. Um, we've seen that um, they have been a real weak point in the community for um, people to get into. Um, we have, including the modern ones, um, we had a group of offenders that were working through Bankview up into Outerdoor and then spreading west through Richmond and into Glendale and Killarney. And they were just targeting poor security or loosey goosey security on condominium buildings. And they were getting into parkades and then we'd get a phone call and we'd have like 15 cars, car proud. Um, we've been doing septed crime prevention through environmental design um assessments on all of those condominium buildings to try and um tighten up their security and putting the onus uh, back really on the managers to make sure that they are safeguarding residents that live in those buildings because a lot of the time i know that residents fight with building managers and landlords and whatnot so it's always good for us to come in throw our weight behind it a little bit and see if we can influence those people to make the right decisions um, so <clears throat> we've had some really good results on that um, social disorder, and by that I mean just you know rowdiness and problematic you know behaviour. The only thing that we have seen around Richmond Knob Hill um, has been the uh, ice rink at the community association. <clears throat> Unfortunately, with COVID, we've had restrictions put in, and we're getting people kind of flouting those rules by you know large gatherings and drinking alcohol and what have you. The drinking alcohol has always been a problem <laughs> at the rink over the years, and we've done various patrols in there just to target through education. Um, but we're still getting those problems now. Um, so we, we, you know, we're doing some patrols in there, making sure things are good. 26 Avenue is also something that's also a bit of an influence on the Richmond Nob Hill area for crime. Um, throughout this year, I've had four problematic addresses along 26 Avenue from 16th Street all the way down to 20, to 20 20th Street. Uh, we've been working on three houses 
Um, all of them have been closed down bar one and that house is now for sale and we expect eviction by the end of the month, maybe into January. Um, but they're mainly isolated crime from the point of view is that they're not actually doing the crime at the houses, they're going out and doing their thing. Um, what we did see during COVID was when the SERP payments were coming out, there wasn't really a monitoring of who got it. And so most of our drug dealers and most of our crime guys and criminals were applying for SERP, getting it, and then moving into condominium buildings within communities. And um, <clears throat> what they were doing is they were turning a, a, a decent building into a nightmare. So we had an issue with that 16th Street that was dealt with very quickly. Um, we had another problem at a house over on 18th Street as well. So that was problematic. And that was all blending into um, our issues around um, uh, the detached garage B&Es. Um, we haven't had a single street robbery uh, reported in Richmond and Hill this year. They're very rare in the city. Uh, robbery is obviously theft with threats of or acts of violence. Um, uh, not like most people think on Facebook, I leave my wallet on the ground and come back, it's gone, I've been robbed. That is not the correct term. Um, so we, we, we're doing very well from that point of view. We work closely with all of the community associations. It's been tough this year to try and get in contact with everyone because not everyone's doing the online meetings. We, um, at the beginning of the year, I put together a large uh, article on car prowlings and I just did another one for breaking in us, which all includes the 9 p.m. routine. And we've had a great deal of success with that. Um, car coverage for Calgary Police has been very good in that area. We've um, we took it back from one district three and a half years ago. Um, we found that we uh, we are probably two, three, or maybe even up to four times more car coverage from from um, CPS members in there because it's that also that link between Outer Door, South Calgary, and Bankview as well. So you probably see us a lot in Richmond, Nob Hill. It's not necessarily because there's a lot of crime because they're not. You're around pretty much the low the low end for me for um for crime which is good you're sort of out of the 13 communities that i run you are approximately ninth for crime in my area which is pretty good and when you consider that when you look at breaking in as um for richmond knob hill we had I'm just to make sure i've got the right stats here for Richmond, we had 40, 32 B and E's for the entire um, for the entire year so far. Uh, if you put that up against Outer Door, which is at eighty seven, uh, we're doing pretty good. And although you're quite a small area, you still have a very dense population in there, and draw a, a link between Outer Door and Thirty Three Avenue. Um, I will talk about traffic safety. Uh, one of the things that comes up around about Richmond Knob Hill is certainly around sort of like your 21 Street uh, area, especially with the construction of the condominium building up near the top, near 33 Avenue. Uh, um, we're getting some issues with uh, problematic driving in that area. What we've been doing is a lot of enforcement in there. Um, we put together an operation with traffic and traffic have been going in there and targeting um uh poor driving you know they're driving the wrong way into traffic they're driving against one way um against stop signs they're speeding through the playground zones and so traffic can be sitting up in there and um constable mcdonald who's the um spot team member who goes in and targets those areas through traffic safety requests um, we've been working in there and uh, we've had some contact with the city about how we're going to try and fix that issue in there so we are continuing to enforce um, in that area. We also had um, another issue that's come up and I will say about Richmond Knob Hill and sort of environs around there is abandoned houses. So you've probably seen in the media this year there was a lot of heat that went um, into Bankview regarding the amount of uh, developers that were um, buying up houses and then leaving them and then we were certainly getting lots of calls for service around um, social disorder, homeless moving in, breaking in, um, and then that would turn into like a drug flop house and then we'd start to see our crime go up. Um, <clears throat> around the end of last year, we had a problematic address in Sonalta, which was an apartment building with about 22 dealers in it, all drug dealers. And we had a very problematic um, landlord. We had someone who was very uncooperative with the police and we developed um, a group called CSRT, 
which is the community safety response team and that's a joint task force between bylaw police fire ahs business license in the city anyone else uh, safety response team calgary police and um we put it together and and through that we have the ability to deal with problematic abandoned properties or properties that are a, a major issue for public health and public safety and so um in richmond up Hill, we have had the odd address where um, we've had someone buy a house and sit on it for six months and in that time we started to see sort of antisocial behaviour, social um, social issues, graffiti, that sort of thing. And so CSRT ha wields a great deal of power and what it does is it immediately goes to the source of the issue which is the person that owns the house, puts pressure on them to fix it, make it secure, turn off the gas or whatever it may be that needs to be done. And if they don't then there's fines imposed. And also there's sometimes a limit given on if they're going to demolish the house, well here's your permit, get it done. So we know that um, we've had a great deal of success with that because we have some problem houses in the bottom of Richmond Knob Hill, um, on the edge of Killarney, certainly in Outerdoor and Bankview in South Calgary and we've started knocking those houses down or getting them sorted out by that, the, the homeowners. Um, there's still some problematic addresses that they're working on but we're having a lot of success with that and believe it or not just one abandoned house can push our stats um, quite high. And then it doesn't just particularly affect one specific community. It can go right the way through one community and bleed over into another. And that's what we were finding with um, Garrison Woods and along 33 Avenue down to 26 Avenue was we had specific offenders that they would commit a crime. We'd get a phone call, a call for service for a crime in progress, would flood that area with units and they would literally disappear. And what we were finding was that they had found their way into a basement window of an apartment building, uh, abandoned building, and get off street like absolutely very, 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 very quickly. So if we have houses like that, we really want to know about them. If you have a house that's next door to you that's empty and it's not being used and you see that there's evidence of people getting in or you think that, you know, it's becoming a problem, we need to know about that because we don't know every single house. Um, we need to know about that so we can certainly work with the city and CSRT to put pressure on the homeowner to start sorting that house out and remove that problem from our community. Um, as a CRO, um, I'm one of four in the office and I look after everything from 17th Avenue to the Weasel Head, from 14th Street to uh, the edge of Killarney. And I work with the other four officers and what we do is we work together collaboratively to deal with um, the issues or long-term strategies that we need to fix. And so sometimes we may have a community like Glendale or Glenbrook or even the 37th Street corridor down by um, Westbrook train station and even that believe it or not can cause issues right the way up through um, the north part of two district and into one district so we're constantly working on new strategies to fix things as much as we can we put extra patrols in um, and I'll explain how we do that what we do is every few weeks we sit down as the CRO group, the management of district two, the detectives, um, the team sergeants and through stats from the analysts calls of service, critical incidents that we've dealt with and in intelligence, we prioritize two things. And those two things we will work on for a serious like a period of time. And by that we will make what's called a targeted patrol. That targeted patrol will then sit on the CAD, the computer in every police car, <coughs> excuse me, in two district. And then when there's downtime, we we are one of, if not the top one of the top three busiest districts in the entire city when there's downtime through the night when the the uh, the call loads start to drop those cars are then targeted into those areas so if we have a problem to say so when we got to the latter part of the year we started getting issues with we had a, an uptick in um in car prowlings into attached cars b and e's in richmond knob hill we made richmond knob hill as a community a um a strategic target what would happen is when members weren't dealing with calls or if they were dealing with calls that to put reports on they would drive into the Richmond Knob Hill and park up in the street or and do their reports in the car or they would just do patrols and go to targeted areas that we know were problematic and then put um, way more patrol hours than we normally do in there to try and dissuade the crime and we had a great deal of success of that and also we shut down the drug house and gained an awful lot of information and intelligence and also spoke to people in the community at three o'clock in the morning um, that just randomly don't live there and walk around um, and um, and speak to them and see what we we can find out from that we dissuade the crime 
So if we have a drug house like we had over on 23 Avenue near Richmond Road, we will target that for anything up to 30 days. And we'll put a lot of pressure on that house. We'll park outside, outside of the drug house, and we'll put our reports on the system and make sure we say good morning to everyone that comes in and goes out. And if we think we recognize someone and we have the reasonable and probable grounds to stop someone and uh, for an offense, we find out who they are and they've got warrants and off the jail they go. Until eventually we make that house so unpopular or we gain so much information that we're able to get through the front door on a search warrant, which at the moment is between 16 and 20 pages of writing to get done once approved by a judge, that's how we shut them down. So we put an awful lot of pressure on them. We will put an awful lot of um, FaceTime in those areas. We're always there talking to the community, allaying fears and making sure that we're seen to make that house or that problematic address unpopular. Um, and just so one thing, we don't just police to crime levels. We police to the fear of crime. So if we if you live in a street where you feel uneasy, there's normally a reason for it. You know, if you've got problematic neighbors or you've got a problem where there's a house where people, there's a lot of foot traffic, people come and go in. We need to know about that because, you know, I think a lot of people think that we, we know everything, Well, we know a lot, but we don't know everything. And the community is really that conduit for our information to come into us. Um, and there's ways of doing it. You can walk in, which you could walk into a police station right now because of COVID, but you can call us in the office and let us know. And if you want to do it um, anonymously, what you can actually do is go through Crime Stoppers. And if anyone knows Crime Stoppers or don't know Crime Stoppers, you can go on the website, look up Crime Stoppers, send the information in anonymously. And because it's an internationally recognized program, I can actually use your anonymous information and put it into a legal document, such as a search warrant, protect you because I don't have to know your name and use that information to then build our grounds to give us the, the grounds to get through the front door on a search warrant. We just did one today. We just took down, a, that's why I'm late off uh, today. We just took down a house in Bowness, which has been, a major source of issue for quite some time. Social disorder, um, people coming and going, uh, and eventually we put various covert tactics in place to record drug deals, which got us a search warrant like yesterday. And the uh, tactical unit went through the front door and gave an early morning, you know, chat this morning. And uh, through that, we arrested two people on secured criminal charges. And now we're working with AHS to get the house condemned if we can, to see if we can make that happen to make a you know, positive impact in the community. So we're constantly busy. We are a 24 seven operation. We don't stop. And we have been impacted by, um, by COVID. Um, the reason the CROs are back on teams is because one team out of 10 members lost six, uh, three positive cases and three other isolated. So there's a lot of things that are going on right now. We're fighting COVID just like everyone else. It has a huge impact on our staffing levels. Um, and, um, and also the way we deal with calls as well. You're probably seeing that police officers are wearing sealed goggles and level one face masks and gloves just to do a traffic stop. That's not because we want to, it's because we have to. So there's a lot of things going on that we're fighting and we're still on the front lines of COVID. We're no, by no means, we're not the, uh, the heroes of this. Um, the heroes are certainly, you know, people that work the checkouts and the janitors and the, the frontline staff and the medical side of things. And they're the, they're, the real, they're the real heroes for this right now. We're just trying to help and support people in the community. Um, we've even done things uh, recently where, you know, we're getting calls to a house that's problematic for noise or what have you. And when we get there, I just dealt with one where mum's dealing with, she's a single parent with three children with ADHD and she's lost her job through COVID. So we're contacting, making sure she's connected with um, various different agencies and we're getting COVID care packages for her to make sure she's okay to support in the community. Um, most of our, a lot of our work isn't always crime based. We do a lot of awful lot of mental health, um, long-term strategies, and we're trying to find new ways of dealing with that all the time. But for Richmond, Nob Hill, um, you, you're doing pretty good. Um, we don't live in a crime infested area. Um, I would guard some people, some people against um, a lot of the stuff they read on social media. Social media is a very, very good conduit for information as, as well as a nightmare for us. Um, it can exacerbate things to the point where we're literally no longer policemen. We're putting out fires online because of the stuff that gets reported. Um, I would give my advice to you to say that if you use anything from social media, make sure it comes from a credible source. Um, words like robbery, I've been robbed in my home. Um, 
that's a home invasion, extremely rare, very targeted. And unless you're a drug dealer or someone that's normally involved in the criminal lifestyle or you've been seriously targeted for a certain thing, you're not going to get affected by that. Uh, what we tend to see generally is petty theft from people stealing from things that are not locked down, unlocked vehicles, um, that kind of thing. Um, the main target of property that we're seeing right now is electronics from vehicles, unlocked vehicles. And so um, what our advice is right now is one, make sure you lock your vehicle. Two, keep your garage opener out of your vehicle uh, and don't leave any property in it. If you have to leave property in your vehicle, make sure that you um, put it in the trunk out of sight. Um, right now we've seen a dispersal and you may have seen this in Richmond Knob Hill of homeless people. You've probably seen more people. The reason behind that is because once the drop-in center and all these other places, the homeless shelters started getting cases of COVID-19, the homeless went into sort of like a protection mode. They started policing themselves. And so we saw a dispersal from the downtown core out into the suburban areas. Um, I just let you know that not everybody that's homeless is committing crime, uh, far from it. Uh, but they are vulnerable persons in our community. So what we're actually doing is we're monitoring and locating all the homeless camps right now. And so um, homeless camps are being monitored by us. We're making sure the homeless guys are okay and we're keeping an eye on them. If that homeless camp or homeless person then becomes involved in crime, then we will shut down that camp, uh, do an investigation, arrest them, whatever we can link them to and treat them like any, any other time someone commits a crime. But what we are doing is we're up in... Um, our efforts in monitoring their homeless camps, we've seen them as far as um, North Glenmore Park, up into Aspen, along the river, Bowness, but you are a semi-inner, if not inner city community. And so it, you can expect to see some homeless people walking around. Most of the people are after their after bottles. So um, if you're putting bottles out for them, make sure they're outside of your back gate. Don't leave your back gate unlo unlocked and leave your bottles on plain view in your garage or in your backyard make sure they're out the way. If you're going to put them out for them, put them out by the bins or away, you know, outside of the footprint of your own property. And that way they have no reason to come in your backyard. So we do get those calls now and then. Um, so for our crime prevention um, advice right now is do not leave property in your vehicle. Make sure it's locked up. Make sure your garage opener is out. And if you do leave property in there, put it in the trunk. Uh, for B and E, uh, for B and E's, uh, nine times out of ten, what we're seeing right now is detached garages that are unlocked. So make sure your side gates shut. Make sure your doors are unlocked. Uh, do your doors are locked, and that you have good locks on them. Make sure that your garage door is down. Um, we, for many years, um, would you know try and find out a way of getting the door down. Now we will give you a phone call at three o'clock in the morning and say, "Hey, your garage door's open." Sorry about that, but we'd rather give you the phone call and make you get all grumpy and get up and, and shut it rather than um, you waking up at seven o'clock in the morning and finding all your bikes gone. Um, so we will do that. But so make sure your garage door is closed. Um, just remember that, um, you know, something like small change in the center console, of your vehicle, maybe, you know, to us, maybe a few bucks and may not be a lot of to us, but for people that are vulnerable in the homeless community, it might be an opportunity, it's like gold to them, right? So there are people that walk around the streets, whether they're homeless or not, and they will try it, they will take money. So please keep everything out of your center console. Um, we've had cases recently of three and $4,000 laptops left in back seats. Um, people going for a run and leaving their handbags on the front seat, complete with cell phones in plain view. Um, and so make sure that you take those steps and, and don't put yourself in offer, just use your common sense. If you have outside lights on your house, make sure that your bulbs are changed regularly and they don't go out. Make sure they're maintained. Keep clear sight lines around your building. Uh, make sure that, you know, if your trees are well overgrown, make sure they're trimmed back and make sure the bushes are trimmed back so that you can see a clear sight line to anyone that may be on your property. So you can change your behavior if you notice them and you don't recognize them. Um, uh, I was talking to a lady the other day. She was wondering how she could sort of improve the security in her backyard. She was worried about people climbing over a fence. Uh, I say plant holly or anything spiky underneath and along the sort of perimeter on the inside of your um, of your fences. Always works good. Uh, it, you know, 
you might, uh, if someone does jump over, you'll always elicit a little scream out of them. It's good to know they're there with a bit of holly um, or anything that's prickly. Um, we also um, think it's a good idea for CCTV. <clears throat> CCTV has um, two functions. Number one, it's a visible deterrent. Um, offenders don't like CCTV. Um, and the reason for that is uh, our most challenged evidence in court is eyewitness evidence. Everyone perceives something a certain way or sees something a certain way, including us. Uh, and I've been a cop for 25 years and just because I've been a policeman 25 years doesn't mean that everything I say on the stand will be taken as the gospel by the court. They'll always question me on everything, how I perceive things, see things, what I thought at the time. With CCTV, it's very, very hard to question because unless they can prove it's been manipulated, which it doesn't get manipulated, um, there is no argument for it. So we will say that um, it's great for a visible deterrent, but it also enables us to gain the information and evidence we require to identify an offender, to charge him and put him in court. And that's, a, that's a, um, a huge step for us because with CCTV, with, without, sorry, without identity, we can't lay a charge. And CCTV has been, uh, amazing uh, for us. I was the search manager for the Nathan O'Brien homicides uh, for 16 weeks uh, when it happened in 2014 and obviously from a motion activate CCTV camera we were able to identify Douglas Garland as the offender in his truck going to and from the house and that was because someone had been car proud uh, before and they put it in their window. CCTV is gold for us, we absolutely love it, it's fantastic so you can pick up a complete system um, you can pick up a, a system, a wireless system from Costco for a couple of hundred bucks. So certainly think about that for sure. Uh, we really love CCTV. Uh, good lighting as well is another good thing. Make sure you have operational locks on your doors and lock them. Um, and that way, if you don't lock them, you won't. If you lock them, you won't forget that you've locked them. So make sure that's done as well. Um, successes uh, this year, we had a guy called David Daniels who was. Uh, prowling all of our areas down into the downtown up into two districts into our areas we laid over 130 odd charges 170 charges i believe this year on him and he's responsible for a whole bunch of car prowlings right across the city so um we uh, he's off the street thank god um we also had uh three four drug houses this year all of which have been shut down um we've done operations on and some of them as simple as uh, just evictions if we don't have full um evidence to get a search warrant. So we've had an awful lot of success in the area, but we just can't let a guard down. Opportunity theft, especially with COVID right now, is something that we're trying to combat in the communities. So we need you to do your side of things. Um, I always say this to, to people, um, people think the Caribbean Police Service are there to keep all your property safe and make sure you're safe and everything else. To a certain extent, yes, uh, but uh, we don't go around checking your door handles for you, making sure your doors are locked and your cars are locked. Um, that is your responsibility. Um, homeowners and property owners, you have an obligation and a responsibility to make sure your vehicles and your houses are safe, locked, secure and operable. Um, my job is to, if a crime happens, gather the evidence, find that person and bring them to justice and help you with crime prevention and give you the advice. Um, we don't fix everything. We don't look after everything. Otherwise, you'd be buying your house and car insurance for the Calgary Police Service, and you certainly don't do that. So what we would say is, you know, you need to help us. We can do so much, but an awful lot of it, if it's your property, you are responsible for it. And so if you are not locking your doors and not have good locks or you're not doing your part, you're putting yourself on offer. And so what ends up happening is that person, that offender will come in get lucky with that theft or whatever it may be and think I'll try that again and try somewhere else until eventually the community becomes a soft target and our stats go up and then we have to have a, a huge response to try and deal with it. Um, the 9pm routine has been posted over I think every single social media in the city. It's huge. Um, it's very, very important that you follow it, try and police yourselves by it. We will do our part for sure, our patrols and you know report crime and we'll do crime prevention and crime prevention patrols and do everything we can but we rely on you as the community to do your part as well and um we hope that you know like if you ever need advice on what to do you can call us at the office or email me whatever you need to do um and we'll happily help you out and give what advice we can to 
make sure that you and your family stay safe. What's that? I see a question come up. What's the 9 p.m. routine? The 9 p.m. routine, I uh, spoke about it earlier. It's just a brochure. Um, I think Graydon had it up. Did Graydon have it up earlier, Mark? So the 9 p.m. routine is basically seven or eight things that are on a, on a leaflet. And, and, and they're things like turn your outside lights on, make sure your doors are closed, take your garage opener out your car, take sure, make sure your property is out your vehicle, make sure your vehicle is locked. Um, simple things like that. It's just a reminder that at 9 p.m. every night before you go to bed um, that you do those things and that you make sure that they are, um, you complete them every single night. So eventually you get into a habit. And um, we have leaflets at the office. If anyone wants them, let me know and I'll drop a bunch off and uh, you can stick it up on your wall in your kitchen and remind yourself. And we've even heard stories of, uh, you know, six and seven year olds pointing at it make sure you do that mum and dad because they've kind of learned it as well so um it's been a very very good um uh it's been very good uh for us there's a question just come up here about the uh, dangers associated with drug houses okay so most of our drug houses are quite uh lower level um we have what we call flop houses so you'll have a problem you'll have a person who's got may traffic a little bit in drugs or has a major addiction they'll move into a house and what they do is they bring people in to use at the house and they will sell within the home um, and that attracts crimes because people commit crime on the way in to get property to sell for drugs to support their habit and then when they leave they do the same thing again because it's constantly like a revolving you know revolving door with them um, so what we tend to do is we'll target the house and look at the person inside the house and then take down that house once we've got a search warrant. The, 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 the main problem around drug houses is the crime that's committed to and from the house. Car prowlings and our detached garage b &Es that we've been talking about. Um, from the point of view of guns, uh, the people that carry guns in the city are the major dealers that are selling this stuff um there we tend to take we tend to arrest them in different ways they tend to meet the um person away from the house sell to the the dealer from the home and then that dealer that's at that home will take the drugs into the house um we do get a lot of success they are high level operations you're talking about a mid to high level dealer and that's dealt with by covert units throughout the city major operations what i deal with is the flop house part of it the social disorder and the criminality around the home and so the drug house is a place where people buy drugs and consume and what we tend to find is the consuming houses or flop houses as we call them are more of a problem because they're so low level and they attract so many people to come in and consume and possess and use their drugs um, that it attracts the most attention and therefore it builds the most fear and anxiety within the community. And then we have to react to that for sure. And so we find that the flop houses are the main issue. Drug houses, if we have a guy who lives in a condo uh, in Bankview or in Richmond Knob Hill and he's selling dope, he tends to get in his car, what we call dialer dopers, and they will drive around the city with a cell phone on and meet their, meet their customers and sell drugs. So what we tend to find that's more common, the dialer dope, People don't really want to uh, do stuff on their own doorstep, if you get what I'm saying. They want it away from their home, the house where they stay or where they keep the drugs. What they do is they get in their vehicle and go sell away from it. The flop house side of it, we still call them drug houses, are the problematic ones where we have people coming to and from the house to use the drugs to get off the street and then to buy a little bit of dope. And that's, that's the problematic side of it. Guns, normally mid to high level. Um, we will do your traffic stop and find a gun. Uh, we'll do a search warrant on a mid-level de dealer and find guns. But the flop houses side of things, it's very rare. Prostitution. Prostitution, we don't see it around drug houses. Prostitution is more of a, um, how can I say it? A more sophisticated profession now. We still have certain areas in the city where girls will walk and guys will pick up. But it was a big change in law a bunch of years ago where they decriminalized the prostitute side of it. They then put the emphasis of enforcement on the johns and the guys that actually buy the sex. And we try and get the girls in the programs and what have you. Um, 
you might have a prostitute who has an addiction that will go to a flop house and use but she certainly won't be doing uh, the prostitution there. They have their own way of doing that. Normally when prostitutes are picked up, the deed is done inside the vehicle or they go to an address, uh, their own personal home nearby, as in the John's home. We don't tend to get an awful lot of prostitution in the flop house. A flop house is there for people to get in, use drugs, be comfortable off street, out the prying eyes of police. Uh, but what illuminates it is the amount of foot traffic that we get to and from the address. Um, so, and then that leads to low level crime and petty theft within the community and our stats start to go up. And then once we start to link it to the house, we target the house and we take the house down. That's how we do it. I wish it was as simple as that, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's how we deal with them. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, that's really all I have right now. Um, we're doing good on stats. We had that blip. In the fall, that's dropped off. We shut the drug houses. Don't have any close by to Richmond Knob Hill right now, which is really good. Um, so we're doing pretty good. We're doing well. So if you're playing hockey at the rink, stop drinking alcohol. Um, we're getting lots of calls for it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rich. And again, uh, again, really, really good information and really lets people know uh, what, what's been going on for sure. Um, what I'd like to do at this at this point is uh, that we're into the question and answer portion of the evening. Uh, what I'll do is I have about two or three questions from people who could not attend the meeting, which I'd like to post to you, Rich. And then we'll go and we'll do the, uh, a systematic roundtable, just give everyone a chance to either ask questions or make comments. And then we'll do the uh, final draw. So the first question I have for you, Rich, is... When should someone call 911? Okay, so 911 is the emergency number. Um, and everyone thinks that that's the number you call the police on for everything. No, um, the, the 911 is when we have people getting hurt, threats of violence, crime in progress, no matter what it is, even if it's as simple as a car prowling. 911 is when you need the police there right now. Um, and then what happens is once that call comes through, it's graded from a priority one, two or three. One, we have to be there within 12 minutes. Uh, two is 45 minutes and three, we get there when we can. And so a 911 call is essentially just an emergency call. So just like if you need an EMS or an emergency, like for a fire engine, or if you need it for an ambulance or what have you, absolutely in this emergency. So sometimes people think that they can call 911 and have a complaint because, you know, it took them too long to get a McDonald's, which we do get. Um, but our 911 system is, um, is a very essential system. 911 is there for emergencies only. Um, so for a non-emergency, uh, that's everything that's not an emergency, uh, is 403-266-1234. That's to report crime, general crime, or if you need to speak to the police on an urgent matter, but it's not an emergency. Um, and that's when we can get a car crew to you. Um, and we have a number of other ways of reporting crime as well. Online is hugely successful. We've been running it for a whole bunch of years, but it's been very important now with COVID. Um, and so you can go onto the Calgary Police website, hit the link and report your own crime and put your own information in there and your synopsis and your statements, you can do it all. And then that gets assigned to an investigatory officer um, as soon as you, uh, within a 24 hour period, I think it is, um, to, to get investigated. Um, so 266-1234 is the non-emergency line and that's for everything that's not 911. And then 911 is for an absolute emergency when you need the police right there, right then. Um, and um, just so you know, with a 911 call, it's very important for domestic violence. If you make a 911 call and then put the phone down, we still come. And a 911 call comes with a great deal of power because with 911, if you make a 911 call out of a house, it gives us a power of entry. So if we get to a house and it's a 911 call, even if the phone's put down and someone comes to the door, like a guy comes to the door and says, no, you're not coming in. We have a power of entry to come in. That's in the criminal code. And because we have actually dealt with domestics like that, where someone, a lady has picked up the phone, dialed 911 and put the phone down without having to talk to us. We've got to the door, the offenders come to the door, said, I don't know why you're here, get out of here. We go in and we find a domestic assault. So 911 comes with a great deal of power. Um, and it's very, very important because we only have a certain amount of dispatchers that will dispatch calls for number one and then uh, so that's for emergencies only okay next question is what should you do 
if you see a crime in progress or you see suspicious activity in progress? Okay, so suspicious activity and crime, two different things somewhat. So if it's a crime in progress, it's a 911 call to us, right? We want to know about that. Um, if you see a crime like a car prowling, a theft or anything where you need the police right there, that's a 911 call. Once you make that call, the dispatcher is going to ask you a whole bunch of uh, questions. Uh, where are you? Where, uh, you know, what can you see? What are they wearing? Can you see weapons? Where are they going now? Um, you know, direction of travel, that sort of thing. Um, and for suspicious activity, let's just say you have a guy that's walking in the street three o'clock in the morning, he's looking in the cars, but he's not actually touching them or what have you. Um, that would also constitute a contact to us, 911, um, because it is really essentially part of a crime in progress. Um, if you have someone, it's suspicious, um, I don't know, you've had a vehicle parked across the street from you for five days, um, it looks unlocked and the, and the steering wheel is punched. That's a 2661234. Offender isn't there. Uh, no one's at risk. You think it's a stolen vehicle or you believe it's a stolen vehicle. That's a 2661234 call. If the offender is there, it's a 911 call. That's the difference. Offender is there, offense is happening or about to happen, someone's um, in trouble, you need help right now, threats of violence, acts of violence, whatever's happened, 911. If it's suspicious, such as, like I said, vehicles parked for a long time, blocking driveways is a classic one. We get a phone call, we we'll go down there, we we'll run the plane, it's stolen. Um, uh, historical crime, uh, if you want to, if you come home from vacation, and you come home and the front door's open and it's been kicked open, that's a 911 call. Because it's a crime, you don't, it might have happened two days earlier, but it's still a safety issue because you don't want to go in the house, you might have someone there. But let's just say you come home from work and you walk in the back door and you, you know, you hang out for an hour and you suddenly realize, hang on, there's a draft from the front door and you realize it's been kicked in. There's no one else in the house, no one's at risk. Two six six one two three four, and we'll come down and we'll get the forensic team to do fingerprinting and we'll report the crime and give you the help and support you need. Okay. Second question or a third question. Uh, this one is kind of an amusing one, but if we come across someone who's an anti-masker, uh, flag flagrantly not wearing a mask in public places, what should they do? Interesting one. Okay, so obviously we've got the COVID restrictions and, and, and guidelines in place. And then the city has its own masking um, side of things. Um, Bylaw. So, outside in a public place, you don't have to wear a mask, right? It's within places that are public, so inside of buildings. Um, the first thing that happens is don't forget that people can have a medical exemption to, from wearing a mask. We, the police, don't actually have a power to find out what that medical exemption is. So people don't carry a card saying, I don't have to wear a mask because I'm asthmatic or claustrophobic. Um, we kind of, uh, it's like an honor system, right? We've, we're kind of hoping that the public will comply and help us out. Um, so if you're inside of a business and you see someone not wearing a mask, you can bring it to the attention of staff. Um, I would seriously go against physically going up to them and challenging them on it um, because we do know there's an awful lot of anxiety and worry around COVID right now. People are having a bad time with it. It's in fact, it's got into every facet of our lives. I get it. But if you are a normal member of the public and you go up and say, why well, you're not wearing a mask, you are not going to get a very good um, reception to that. So if staff then, as their point and responsibility is to speak to someone and say, can you put your mask on? Well, I have a medical exemption. I don't have to, I can't wear it because I'm this, that and the other. Okay. Uh, if staff go up and say, you haven't got a mask on, it's like, oh my God, I'm sorry. That's normally the trigger for someone to put their mask on. You know, we've all forgotten to pick up a mask every now and then. Um, so it's a difficult one. Okay. So we can... If we, we've only, we have laid a whole bunch of charges for people not wearing masks and normally it's a case of why are you not wearing a mask? So I don't want to wear it. Why don't you have a mask on? I don't believe in it. You know, whatever it may be, the conspiracy theories, whatever it may be. And with that point, when it's flagrant, what they call flagrant contravention of bylaw, that's when we'll lay the ticket for sure. And it's only a $50 fine, right? Um, 
and as you've seen, we've got these anti-masking rallies that are going on right now, and I've been personally involved in those on the PSU side of things. It's very difficult to deal with, very hard to deal with. So um, from anti-masking side of things, I would suggest, number one, stay away from the marches and rallying in the downtown core. You know, on Thursdays and Saturdays, stay away from them. We have to deal with them, unfortunately. It's very, very hard on us to deal with it, but we are dealing with it. Number two, if you go into a public place or a business and someone's not wearing a mask, please bring it to the attention of the staff. They have um, all have little plans within their building or their business to deal with it. Um, don't go up and personally challenge someone. And if you feel uncomfortable with someone not wearing a mask near you, get away from them. Um, that's the way I would do it. But um, if you see a problem around masking where someone is blatantly, flagrantly breaching the rules, you can call us on the 2661234 number um, and just, or just bring it up to, uh, to staff. Oh, good question. So um, even though COVID is still going, we're still in the middle of a, an opioid epidemic. And so we are seeing, so my background, I came as a policeman in London for 10 years. So what we dealt with there was sort of like your cocaine and your heroin, because we were in Ireland. Calgary is a little bit different, we're landlocked. And so when I came here in 2005, it was crack cocaine, crack everything. That's all we found on people and weed, whatever. Um, now, what we are, we have seen in the last four or five years is an influx in methamphetamine and fentanyl. Uh, the oxycodone side of things, opioids, that sort of thing. Big, big effect on people. Um, what we find with meth is it can, it can be made in a meth lab in, you know, uh, in someone's living room. You can make meth from, you know, the ingredients you can buy from Shoppers Drug Mart. And so the profit margins are very high especially with fentanyl um i mean like in the millions of dollars and you know people you know you see the news about shootings and things that are happening like that that's all over drugs like fentanyl because the profit margins are in the hundreds of percents so what we are finding with most of the people that have addictions right now uh is fentanyl and an interesting stat on this is that 80 percent of fentanyl use is in the suburbs so it's not like uh, I'm a homeless guy and I've got an addiction downtown. That is part of it. But most of it, because fentanyl is expensive, it's used in the, in the suburbs. So we have found realtors, architects, bankers, uh, people with very affluent and very well-educated jobs in flop houses buying uh, baggies of fentanyl. So it affects everybody. Um, <clears throat> so the biggest issue we have right now is fentanyl and opioids um, that we are that we're getting on the street? It's very hazardous to use, incredibly hazardous for us. Um, we have to. We always have gloves on when we're dealing with people, anyway, regardless of whether COVID was here or not. Uh, we always wear gloves, and the reason is it can be absorbed through the through the skin. And we have had officers go down with it, um, and we've had in fact, and we've also had um exposures within property rooms and uh believe it in police stations where officers have been infected with it fentanyl um is the lead opioid that we deal with car fentanyl even worse one grain of sand size can car, car fentanyl will kill you six grains of sand size of fentanyl will kill you um and the problem with fentanyl always is i'll give you the idea is if we will talk about making chocolate chip cookies uh, you could make chocolate chip cookies and get three chocolate chips in one and 30 in the other. And that's what's happening with the dosages. People are taking fentanyl, they might take it 50 times and not have an overdose, um, or they might take it three times and die. Um, so <clears throat> we are finding large amounts of naloxone, um, and most of your addicts will carry a naloxone kit. And so um, if they're found by the public, they can you know, give them the Narcan up the nose or the naloxone shot. So uh, fentanyl is the main issue there. And for cheaper drugs, methamphetamine. Meth is very, very prominent in the city. Um, we are a big city, we're 1.2 million. We still have the pro big problems for a big city. And so methamphetamine is something that we predominantly see in the pockets of nearly every addict. Uh, but fentanyl is something that we're seeing all the time as well. And it really is a huge, it's basically, um, I don't know what the stats were. I think we were losing two or three Albertans a day to it. Um, <clears throat> we we knock out a lot of people. We stick a lot of knock out at people's noses until EMS get there um, from fentanyl. So um, that's why, and you know, some people ask, well, why do I see a lot of like 
addicts around like the train station or libraries and stuff like that there's a reason for that is because if they use it and they have an overdose in a very public place they'll be found and help we got to them quickly so that's why we started seeing when the op opioid epidemic started we were finding people in tim hortons starbucks um, train stations libraries city hall believe it or not and, uh, and and places where police patrol because they know that if we find them we can get help to them and that's the same with, with with the flop houses the reason they're flop houses is because multiple people go there to use drugs and they all keep an eye on each other and they all carry an naloxone so a lot of the time they're they're helping their friends out come back from a, a near fatal overdose so that's what we're seeing methamphetamine and fentanyl weed legalized whatever we, we 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 look at weed from the point of view of impaired driving and major dealers of illegal weed that bring in and make an organized crime for sure but there are legal amounts that people can have and to be honest with you i've in 25 years of policing i don't think i've dealt with weed so little as i have now which is good um and our impaired driving side of things is good as well we're doing well on that but it's the opioids that are giving people fatal overdoses and killing people um we are you know we are dealing with, we've had drug houses where we've had half a dozen overdoses that are fatal um and you know before we can even react to it like within a day a couple of days we've had them where there have been multiple fatal overdoses so fentanyl for certain and methamphetamine 